our ranking member uh, Chaffetz, members of the subcommittee hearing, witnesses and all those in attendance. Today's hearing will examine the trends and characteristics of the present day federal workforce as well as assess the federal government's human resource management capabilities. The chair, ranking member and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make the opening statements and all members will have three days to submit revisions and statements for the record. At this time I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the testimony from the Human Rights Campaign be submitted for the record. Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Again, I'd like to welcome our ranking member, uh, Jason Chaffetz, and my fellow members of the subcommittee as we hold our first hearing to examine the federal workforce issues in the 111th Congress. I'd also like to thank today's witnesses for helping our su subcommittee with its work. While the federal government faces an unprecedented number of major policy issues and challenges that must be addressed on behalf of the American people, it's critically important that we take a moment to evaluate the state of our workforce and the 2.6 million men and women responsible for making government work every day. Today's hearing is entitled uh, The Public Service in the 21st Century, an Examination of the State of the Federal Workforce. And I've called this morning's hearing to examine the trends and characteristics of the present day federal workforce as well as to assess the current status of the federal government's human resource management capabilities. The subcommittee will explore both the structure and the quality of the government's people management skills and determine what future legislation might be needed to tackle any of the issues and gaps in coverage presented here. In many ways, today's hearing will lay the groundwork for considering the various approaches or policies needed to ensure that the government is operating as an employer at it, and is up to the task of meeting these pressing challenges. Uh, for the United States to remain a global power, high-performing civil servants are necessary to do the business of government. And in turn, these employees should be rewarded for their talents, their skills, their hard work, and as public servants. I believe the federal government must be in a position to respond to the changing nature of, of public service and to address those answering the call of public service. As chairman of the subcommittee, I'm committed to making this happen. It is our responsibility here in Congress to ensure that federal agencies are equipped with the resources necessary to attaining proper staffing levels and providing beneficial training and rewarding their accomplished workforce. I expect that today's witnesses will both bring us up to speed on the pressing needs and issues facing today's federal employees as well as offer effective human resource management strategies for the government to adopt based on their own experiences and their day-to-day -day knowledge. I look forward to an informative hearing this morning. Uh, this concludes my opening statements and I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I appreciate you calling uh, uh, this hearing here today. Uh, I appreciate the witnesses who are taking time from the busy schedules to be here and share this information with you, with us. I also want to particularly thank the in excess of 2.6 million uh, men and women across this country who care deeply about their country, who work hard and are often the unsung heroes and don't get nearly enough uh, recognition and credit for the hard work and dedication they put into their jobs, serving their communities and, and making this country uh, the greatest country on the face of the planet. Uh, I would like to apologize in part at, at the beginning here uh, for the up and down nature of my needing to scoot next door uh, in the my committee assignment and judiciary has a number of bills in markup and please don't let that be a reflection of a uh, uh, lack of interest. I will be able to review the record in, in its uh, entirety, uh, but my apologies, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the up and down nature of, of having uh, two meetings at the same time. Uh, I do have an extended statement that I'd like to, I would ask a unanimous consent be submitted to the record. And with that, uh, if that's okay with you, then I will uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from uh, the District of Columbia, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton. Well, thank you very much, much Mr. Chairman. Mr. Belbray. I think this is a uh, particularly important hearing to have now because I'm confused. Uh, on the one hand, before this, we have been having hearings on the flight of federal workers from the workforce. One of the things I'm most interested in is whether or not the uh, 
putrid economy we inherited has had an effect on, on making the baby boomers, the oldest of whom have uh, begun to retire, want, want to stay on. These are very experienced workers in whom we have invested a great deal. Uh, on the other hand, I understand that there, are, that there has been substantial turnover uh, in the federal workforce. I don't know if those, those are the ones who got, up before, got, got out before they looked at their uh, 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 functional equivalent of the 401k or not. Uh, but I do think that what you're doing is very, very important in preparing us for a period ahead, which looks like it may be a bit different from the hearings we've had in the past where we uh, uh, pulled out our hair because we thought that we were losing workers uh, at such a rapid rate. I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say I appreciate the hearing. Um, you know, as a former public employee, I think that too often those of us on the policy side forget that every study in the world has proven that um, even though uh, compensation and status is important in public employment, job satisfaction of feeling like you're doing something productive is the number one um, component of retention of, of public employees. And we overlook that all the time because you can't negotiate this and you can't quantify it on a piece of paper. It's something that has to be an overall goal of the whole team. When people feel like they're making a difference, like they're actually doing something rather than just filling a seat during a period of time, that job satisfaction reflects, is reflected not only in the longevity but in increased productivity. And I, I think that one of the biggest challenges that I would ask us to look at is to recognize that um, while it's easy for us to look at what the pay rates are and compare it to the private sector, what the ability to move up the, the uh, status le level in public employee is, that the ability of the bureaucracy to actually perform and provide the services the public wants is the most critical component, not only to the taxpayer and the constituency, but to the public employees themselves. And I think that's one thing that we overlook all again. I was a lifeguard, and let me just tell you something. I would have taken half the pay for the days where I made the 50 rescues for the days that I sat through those cold, dreary winters when nobody else was on the beach except my, myself. And I even got a, a premium for sitting through those cold days. Of course, that's cold days in San Diego. You got to remember, that's, that's 60 degrees. <laughs> but I just think that we, we forget about that too often because too, uh, too often we think about just pay and status rather than service. And remember, people in a public employee are the overwhelming ones that really need to be retained are those who care more about service than even their own compensation. So I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I agree. As a, as a current public employee, I, I agree heartily. Not a, not a lifeguard, a sort of a lifeguard, but without, without the water. Uh, how about, uh, it, it is the common policy of this committee that uh, witnesses are sworn in. And uh, so I would ask uh, the witness to please rise and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear that this testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Let the record indicate that the witness has answered in the affirmative. And uh, the witness's entire statement is already included in the record. The green light will indicate uh, you have five minutes to su summarize your statement. Uh, I'm sorry. The green light indicates you have five minutes. And then the yellow light means you have one minute remaining to summarize your, your statement. And the red light indicates that your, your time has expired. Uh, we, are, uh, we are gifted uh, this morning to have uh, as our first witness uh, the, the new, very new, uh, director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, John Berry. Uh, John Berry serves as a director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, which manages the federal government's civil service. Uh, prior to Mr. Berry's appointment, as director of OPM, he was the director of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the director of the Smithsonian Zoological Park. Mr. Berry previously served as assistant secretary for policy, management, and budget at the Department of the Interior during the Clinton administration, where he oversaw a number of programs to improve employees' work-life balance. Earlier, he served as legislative director of the House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer for 10 years, and as, as uh, Steny's lead on federal employee issues, he helped to guide the negotiations that led to the 1990 Federal Employees Pay Comparability Act. Uh, we welcome 
uh, the new director. I think it's been six or seven days now, so we want to hear everything you've accomplished so far. Uh, and, and welcome, welcome uh, Director Berry. Just, there we go. Can you hear Ms. That's okay? Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm uh, especially pleased uh, for my inaugural hearing as the new director uh, to be with you today so that we can really step back, and I think this is a great time to do this at the beginning of a new administration, and look at where are we with the Federal Civil Service. Um, in day seven on the job, I have to tell you my reaction after my first week on the job has been a little bit I feel that I am a member of either, I'm not sure which movie I fit into, either Back to the Future or Groundhog Day, but uh, when I was working these issues back in 1985 for Mr. Hoyer, uh, it was interesting, and I just want to give you sort of my sense to begin with, if I could, since my statement's been in the record, to, to give you my sense of where I think we are today. Um, back in 85, the Employment Cost Index had identified uh, at that time a comparability gap between uh, federal employees and their counterparts in the private sector that averaged somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. Now, there was an argument at the time as to what exactly how it was, but it was a clear agreement that there was a gap. Uh, the bad news is, is that that gap is essentially, that argument has not moved uh, in the 25 years since I have come back to this issue. We are still in that same, the ECI index that we're still arguing it's somewhere between 20 and 25 percent, but it's, it's still a very significant gap. Now, obviously, through the lens of one of the most serious recessions since the Great Depression, uh, that gap uh, is, is, might not be as evident today in terms of what we're looking at and seeing in trends, but it is something we need to always keep in the back of our minds as to our competitiveness and our abilities. On diversity, I look at every rank uh, on, on every category. Diversity hasn't moved uh, hardly at all since 85 in terms of federal representation across the board. Um, our scores would be, uh, uh, would be laughable even at a t-ball game. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is an embarrassment. Uh, union labor management relations, I would categorize right now as weak to non-existent. Um, the concept of partnership has dried up and we need to be about reviving it. On hiring, um, and I think this is one that it is widely recognized in the public, but after my quick assessment, having been at OPM, uh, like I say this week, I would rate our hiring at, uh, you would best measure it in geologic time. Uh, it uses a language that was last used, I think, with the lost civilization of Atlantis. And uh, I think there is a modern concern you know, in 1883, when Teddy Roosevelt sat in this chair in the prior Civil Service Commission, um, he was up here primarily concerned that people got federal employment by basically providing payments to members of Congress in the, in the House and the Senate. Well, today, if you want a federal job, you're not pay giving that money to a member of Congress or a senator, but you're giving it to a company that's helping you fill out the application, which I think is an outrage. Um, we ought to be able to allow people to apply for jobs in a simple way using plain English that allows us to hire people who are qualified for the jobs based on their determination of their qualifications. And the fact that it is so complicated is something we have got to break. Um, on recruitment, we have a nice tool belt, but it doesn't have many tools in it. Uh, on internships, we have one of the worst conversion rates in the United States. Right now, we hired about 50,000 interns on average a year and during the summer months. We convert less than 1% of those to real employment. Now, the private sector converts somewhere, it ranges between 25 and 50% of those interns. They use their intern program as a way to give a trial run to folks and bring good people on board. We don't do that in the federal government, and it's a huge lost opportunity. You all read in the paper this morning in Joe Davidson's column about our IT issues and the GAO report on retirement. That is one of many IT issues that I've been briefed on this week. I gotta tell you, it's a big problem and it, uh, it is one that's gonna require a lot of attention. I am extremely concerned over what I consider to be a balkanized pay system. Uh, we are now in a situation where we do not have a majority pay system for the United States government. And we have workers sitting side by side doing the exact same job, being paid differently. And I can't defend that to you with a straight face. 
And I think we need, it is, it is now reached the point, you, we can get along with sort of doing experiments and demonstrations and trying different flexibilities, but at some point we've got to come back and say what makes sense, what works, and design a system that works for the majority of workers in the federal government. Um, training. It's the first thing cut in a budget and it's the last thing restored. And we've got to change that. In our complex world, we can't deal with that. Our performance appraisal systems lack credibility with the employee, with managers, and with the public. We've got to do a better job. And my experience with OPM's budget is that essentially what I have found is that a majority of our budget is on a reimbursable basis. Now what that means is I may have my hand on the rudder, but the rudder is not responding. Uh, we are responding to where our customer is putting the dollar. And our discretionary budget is so small that it doesn't allow us to lead in ways that we need to. Now that's a pretty bleak assessment to begin with. Um, there are some bright spots. And I would begin with them. I, see, I think there are three. And the good news is those bright spots overwhelm any of these dark ones. The first is that, thank God, despite all of these challenges and dark forecasts, which I've just explained to you, the outstanding men and women who serve this country today in the civil service are doing an incredible job. They are staying focused. They are delivering the product that the taxpayer expects. And hats off to them for, for not letting the systems that where we have failed them, essentially, uh, uh, affect their work. Mr. Bilberry, you are dead right. Uh, and I am happy to report to you that our, our morale surveys actually show that we're doing pretty well on that front. And it's a good thing that our employees actually think they're doing important work. They think it matters to this republic. Um, their importance, uh, they understand the importance of their work and they believe that they're contributing uh, to the health of the, of the nation. And, and that is actually our, our rating, our survey ratings have gone up on that. So it's, it's, it's an absolute rock solid important thing. If we didn't have that, we couldn't really move forward. But because we've got that, and we've got solid men and women in the civil service, I think we can fix each of these other things. And then the final three, the third bright spot I would mention to you is that employees at OPM I have met are solid. Uh, we've got some great management talent, and the, man the employees I've met uh, are skilled, they're professionals, and I think the bottom line is, is if, if my leadership is up to snuff, we ought to be able to do something on these darker points that I've made to you. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm going over, but if, if with your indulgence, uh, uh, maybe one or two with, more with minutes. With all due respect, Mr. Director, you've been over for a long time now. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> however, I think perhaps in the course of our questioning and answering, you can hit on the other points that you want you want to hit on. I just I, don't want to set a precedent of uh, allowing you ten minutes and then everybody else is five. Gotcha. So. Well, Mr. Chairman, seeing he spent so much time complimenting me, I think he should yeah. spend another time. I was, I was actually going to cut him off when he started doing that. but uh, well, well, Mr. Chairman, if I... If I if yeah. I could, just to, to mention sure. what I would like Please. to comment is, is the game plan for what I see as the way forward. And hopefully in, in question and answer, we could get some of that out. Because I, I, I don't want to leave it at all as, as the dark. I believe we have a bright path forward. And, and, and what I would just, you know, would like to lay before the committee what my vision would be uh, for addressing all of the issues that I've raised with you. Terrific. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> and, and what I'll do is I can actually, uh, you know, in... in uh, <clears throat> In the questioning portion of this, I can give you ample opportunity to uh, to, to make make those points, which which are indeed uh, important. Uh, let me let me begin the questioning with with that. Uh, we we've got a situation here where uh, the the central and, and we talked about this before you and I, uh, where you have a system that is a rule bound for for federal employees. Uh, that might have served uh, the needs of federal employees some, some decades ago, but ha that has hung on, and that uh, as a result of the unworkability of some of those guidelines and rules, uh, independent agencies, not, not just to flaunt the rules, but to accomplish things, uh, actually opted out and created their own systems for hiring, for promoting, for assessing uh, you know, performance. So now what we have, and this has happened, you know, everywhere. And, and I don't blame the agencies because they were trying to do something that actually worked that was, that was uh, uh, common sense and, and productive. So I don't think that they, 
just through ill will broke out of the rules. I think they did it by necessity. However, now we're left with a, I don't know if you call it Balkans, Balkanized, but I wouldn't want to do that injustice to the people of the Balkans. Uh, <laughs> it is really, it is not a system at all. It, it, is, it is because system, re, you know, implies some type of coherence and, uh, and, and uh, compatibility. This is really an ad hoc system that has now been created by different agencies to do their own thing, basically, to try to get things done. So we've got a, a real hodgepodge out there of, uh, of, of, of employment policy. So, you know, it, it, that hurts OPM because it's your job to provide that overall framework. How do we get there? How do we, how do we uh, create a framework that takes the best of the lessons learned that we have out there. Some of these agencies are doing wonderful things, innovative, uh, uh, in spite of, uh, you know, our, our uh, ham-fisted attempt at managing uh, human resources. How do we take the best but knit together a system that doesn't result in having folks working side by side at the same desk, making disparately uh, different uh, salaries uh, both of them working hard at the same job. H how, how do we get there? Mr. Chairman, I think uh, you, you've hit the nail right on the head. I, I think it is time for us to really think, and it, it, it will take uh, the partnership of everyone on this committee, I think uh, all of the people testifying here today to work together with us on this, uh, to essentially come up with a new baseline system. Um, I think that system has to sort of have three key elements to it. If, if I were, you know, in terms of what I would, the roadmap forward on this. One is it needs to be a fair system for employees. Employees need to feel that the, that the basic pay structure that it establishes uh, has meaning, it is related to, uh, to standards and, and, and that are recognized, and that employees feel that it is fair and, and applied fairly across the board. Second big point I would make, Mr. Chairman, it's got to have a credible assessment system. Uh, it's got to be clear on telling people what their job is, what their critical elements are, holding them accountable to performing those, correcting them where they're weak, rewarding them where they're strong, and eliminating non-performers. And, uh, you know, so I think we need to come up with that's got to be a critical element of this to the American public. The third thing is training. And we, we mentioned that. It, it is unfortunately uh, non-existent pretty much across the government today. And we need, that has to be a, a key component of any major plan going forward because we kid ourselves, uh, you can get away cutting training for one or two years, but you can't do it for the long run as we have done in, in the government. And, and so I think those three elements, if we can come up with a fair pay system, a credible assessment system and appraisal approach, and a strong training component, if, if, if we, can, we can devise a system that has, has strength on those three fronts, uh, I think we can restore the integrity of a, of a majority pay system for the country. Uh, thank you. At this point, I recognize uh, for, for questioning uh, Mr. Chavis, our, our ranking member. Uh, again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for being here, and, and congratulations on the, on the new appointment. Um, let me ask you, uh, uh, pay for performance, does it work? You know, there are some, uh, as in any system, uh, there are good things and there are bad things. I think we have found some very uh, good things, um, and there's some warning lights. Um, I am meeting, in fact, later today with the Deputy Secretary of Defense to discuss uh, the, the Defense Department's uh, uh, system that they have developed um, and how we can uh, assess that and... and uh, but do you and, think it has room in the, in the federal government, in the workforce? You know... Performance, it has to be in the federal government. Uh, it is in the GS system. Pay for performance or just performance? Well, it, it, it is not widely used, but I'll tell you, having been a manager, you can use it. Within grade steps can be tied to annual performance appraisals. Um, where, where, and, where do you see the challenges then with it? Um, it's, it, uh, it is not strong enough. We do not have a system that has credibility with any of the major partners that we need to have it, the employees, the managers, or the public. Yeah, and, I, and it, it, it just to editorialize a little bit myself, the, I, your, uh, your check marks here of being fair and credible and the training component, I think, are spot on. I, 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 I would concur with that. Um, I would just hope that 
given the short time here for me to ask a series of questions that you do seriously consider. I do think it has uh, relevancy, maybe not for every job, but uh, certainly the concept, the principle, the idea that we're rewarding performance, uh, I think is, uh, is uh, sorely needed and it could be implemented uh, in an effective way, and I'm glad to hear, hear your comments on that. I would like to go, if I could, to this uh, Washington Post story that, that came out today, because uh, you certainly have your hands full. Uh, a particular note was this uh, idea that uh, um, the uh, OPM cut it. It says, uh, quote, in October, the OPM cut its losses when it killed a $290 million 10-year contract with Hewitt Associates. Maybe we should have them here, uh, which was to have developed an advanced retirement calculator to speed the processing of claims by, anyway, it goes on. What are we going to do about that? Uh, the good news is, is it, it, we didn't lose $290 million, but by, uh, by closing off the contract, uh, essentially, I think we cut our losses. Um, this has been a huge problem. This has been the third attempt OPM has made at this is of revising the retirement system. This started back in 1982. There have been three attempts. Um, the total cost that's been invested over that period of time, over both Republican and Democratic administration attempts to reform this, uh, is approaching $100 million. Um, what we have to show for that is precious little. Uh, we have been able to, with that money, at least cobble together a patchwork quilt system that manages to work. Uh, but it does it in a way that does not inspire confidence. And uh, I just got briefed on this in my first week. Um, uh, and I can tell you this, um, I am not just going to race off and continue what's been happening since 1982. I think we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to engage and involve other agencies that have done major systems innovations. Social Security does this regularly. The IRS does this regularly for a lot more people than we're talking about. And I think in many ways, uh, my just personal assessment of where this went off the tracks is they tried to swallow the elephant. Um, you know, Could they, you maybe pick a different animal? <laughs> that's a good... <laughs> with all, with, yeah, it's apologies to the, the metaphor. Um, but point but well taken. They... they, they they were trying to solve everything, and as an end result, solved nothing. And, it, it, and how would you rank this in terms of your priorities as you? It, it's we've got to. Do, uh, let me tell you that the core part of it is that it, it's got to be. It's it's got. We got to do the job right. Is we got to figure out what retirees are owed correctly, and we got to pay them correctly on time. That's job one. And so, what my direction is to my team is going to be is let's figure out how to do job one well. That's a must have. It would be nice if employees could sit at their desk and call up their retirement system and play with options and think about what day they could retire. I think of that as a nice to have. And we ought not be wasting money trying to do the nice to haves until we have the must haves done. And so my game plan here is going to be to whittle this down to what must be done because we right now are systems that are providing these checks and making these determinations are on the verge of failure. Um, they're working, and they're working today accurately, but we need to make sure they can continue to work and handle the growing boom. And so I'm going to whittle that down to that core issue and then focus on it by bringing in other outside expertise to advise us on a course forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barry, the last time... Uh, uh, I spoke to you, you were running the zoo, and I'm trying to understand uh, what it is about running the zoo that makes you uh, so qualified to run federal employees, and I'll put that aside for the moment, but I know of your long service in the federal government. I'm pleased to have you, um, particularly given your, your, the demonstration of, of managerial excellence uh, you have shown throughout your service. Um, the um, I, I indicated my confusion about whether we have openings or not, whether people are retiring or not. Uh, I I would like you to clear that up for me. Um, we have you we un we understand that there are still challenges uh, in recruiting people to public service. We see the administration going all out to make public service 
sexy again, shall we say. Um, ha, um, are people retiring at the same rates they were before the economic crisis or not? And if there is so much unemployment, why are you having trouble recruiting people to federal service now? Uh, Congressman Norton, I think um, right now I, uh, I would have to get back to you to see if we have accurate data. I have not seen data that captures the current moment uh, that would be, which would be right on point with your question. I would ask yet. you to get us that data within 30 days. That's critical. An early sign of whether or not there has been some some cessation of what was uh, people taking early retirement, retirement, and they were getting out of Dodge, and right. then using all of our investment in them uh, to go into the private sector, even become contractors and use our, our experience then um, in, in that way. Uh, tell us about contracting out. Um, why would the government be contracting out if you're having such trouble uh, recruiting people, uh, is contracting out the only way to get the federal job done, or do you intend to do the wholesale contracting out of the government that we have seen in the last several years? Uh, definitively no is the answer to, is it the only way to get the job done? Um, <clears throat> contracting out can be a very helpful tool for the government uh, when it is used strategically. Uh, when it is used sloppily and slipshoddily, I think we need to be very careful because it, it can essentially uh, uh, confuse the mission of the government. It can blur its regulatory responsibilities. Uh, we need to be very careful with it. And uh, right now, my sense is, my understanding is that the government is going to be what's, we're going to face a different issue. Rather than contracting out, we're going to face what we call insourcing. Um, a lot of, of uh, departments have been discussing with me, including the Department of Defense, wanting to move what they believe are employees that are providing on contract basis back onto the federal roles. And so we're, our challenge is going to be how can we do that? How can we handle the, the hiring and make sure we get those people back onto the roles that are good and allow for fair and open competition uh, consistent with the merit principles? So. Um, I think what you're going to see is a new trend uh, in government. And, and to your point about the retirees, I, you know, there's no question with an aging society, we have got to be creative in figuring out how we're going to benefit from that skill set and that talent. Uh, it, you know, it ought not just be on the golf course. We need to keep those people in government longer. We need to re figure out how we're going to re-engage their, their assets. And to do that fairly... It's, it's a complicated thing because we have to balance that with still providing well, opportunity for growth. one of the things that encourage people to leave government is to take your pension and then become an employee of a contractor. And yep. Mr. Barry, I wish you would, would, would do some work to discover just how many federal employees leave the federal government to go on to a contract and whether that's in the interest of the federal government. Finally, let me ask you about the union management partnership. Uh, one of the most effective... Uh, um, notions. Uh, I remember from the Clinton administration was, I believe is the right name for a union management partnership, which even some federal agencies understand the EPA have begun to reestablish. These things were wiped out. I don't know why one wouldn't just want to talk to unions if you believe in labor peace. Um, are you uh, c considering um, reestablishing the union management partnership notion which would cover all agencies in the federal government? Uh, yes. Uh, we are very seriously looking at that, Congresswoman Norton. Um, in fact, that was going to be my second priority in terms of after overall pay reform of reviving partnership and an effective and active partnership program with labor. Uh, and I will be work, looking forward to work with both all of the union heads, the Office of Management and Budget, and the President to see if we can sculpt a positive way forward that, that creates a positive relationship between labor and management. All right. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, let me just follow up on the issue that the delegates brought up, the gentleladies raising different issues about um, the way the system structured almost to encourage people to retire and leave the system. And I think one of the examples is that the current uh, prey caps for um, GS-15s 
means they can earn up to a certain amount. And if they stay employed, they're locked into a limit. But their continuing service, there is no such limit for their retirement benefits continue to grow. So you literally create a situation to where you're, there's an incentive to retire, not to stay employed. So I think a lot of this, as we talk about the way the individuals may move the private sector, um, why is this done? What's the logic behind it? You know, Mr. Bilber, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I don't, I can't give you a good explanation of what the logic of that is. So, uh, you know, I think this is, this is going to be a, it's got to be an issue we all wrestle with together. Shouldn't it be sort of flipped the other way? <laughs> then that seemed like it's really um, stacked in the opposite direction that logically, I know that, I hate to use that term around the federal um, systems, but let's use that radical concept of logic. Why would an employer create a system like this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can't, I, I don't want to pretend to tell you that I, I wouldn't defend it because I, I don't understand exactly why they would do it. It certainly seems counterintuitive. Um, and, uh, but I think I do need to talk to some people who understand this issue in detail and, and make sure I'm not missing something. Okay, so we, we agree that on its face, it looks like it's something that needs to be changed, but let's look into it. I think there's a justification to say, justify this process, not based on some, something that went on before or some kind of agreement that went on before, but what is the outcome right now? And I just hope we spend more time looking at outcomes rather than intentions and go and be willing to br be brave enough to go correct it. Mr. Chairman, I've always said ever since, you know, government, the biggest problem with Washington is we try new things or that we make mistakes, but that when we try new things and make mistakes, we're not brave enough to go back and correct it. So I would ask us we take a look at that. Mr. Berry, I served 16 years on Air Resources Board agencies in California, and one of the most environmentally friendly and energy conservation strategies that we could ever implement is telecommuting and flex time to reduce the emissions and the, the consumption of fuel for employees going back and forth and reduce the demand on having to build new infrastructure to carry it. Um, now, the Patent and Trade Office has demonstrated that they can work within a telecommunication issue. Um, what's the status of this concept uh, across the board when it comes to the federal workforce? Uh, you will find in me, sir, a, a strong proponent of both telecommuting and flex time. I, I agree with your assessment. These are valuable tools, not only for the employees improving their, their uh, productivity and uh, enhancing their family work life situation, but in also affecting our environment in a positive manner. So I'll be very supportive of it. I, I think, you know, we do have to be careful and work with managers. Uh, as Ms. Norton pointed out, I ran the National Zoo, and, and it would be, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately there are some positions you just can't telecommute. Uh, you know, you got to feed the animals in the morning. They can't do that from home. So, it, you know, at, at some positions it, it can't work. But for those that it can, we really ought to exploit it. We need to be supportive of it. We need to make it easier, and we need to make it more uh, accessible throughout the federal government. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I'll just tell you a story off one of the most deserted parts of the world, the, uh, the central coast of Baja, California, I ran into a French engineer on his boat who was delivering his work to Paris by the internet every day. Um, boy, what a, that's the kind of job I'd, I'm looking for down the line. But I think that, <laughs> that, that uh, I just think these are, these are two issues that the delegate and I totally agree on. And it's, I know that problem we ran into in California is that organized labor did not like the concept because they saw it as be the possible being a barrier or giving independence to an employee separate from the organized strategy and harder to organize because they weren't physically in one plant. That's not the problem here, is it? Uh, you know, I would have to talk with our labor leaders about that in the spirit of partnership. I think one of the first rules of partnership is good and fair and open communication. So I'd like to pose that question with them and really discuss and get their input. Um, you know, my assessment is, is, you know, where this is, where there is a bargaining unit, that would obviously be something that would be subject of, you know, of the bargaining process. So, uh, you know, I, I think I'd look forward to working with the nationals uh, and their leaders to see if we can, we can solve concerns they might have, uh, because the objective is a good one. It's, it's an important one. We, we need to be about doing as much as we can to improve the work life and workplace for our federal employees. 
And this is, those are two good tools to do it. And Mr. Chairman, just in closing, let me just say, I, I, I find it hard to believe that that's a problem in our federal system. I hope it isn't. My frustration was in California at the state system that they literally said that an individual could not make an agreement with management to do telecommunicating unless it was incorporated into a formal union agreement, which created huge barriers. And I hope that we, I just can't believe we've made that mistake in the federal system and I hope to, that we avoid that. I think the individual still is premier against the bureaucracy or even organized labor, that the individual really needs to be allowed to do the right thing. So thank you very much. I appreciate it, Mr. Berry. I uh, thank the gentleman. And just to, just to clarify a point, in, in the chairman's uh, discussions with the labor unions in this instance, the labor unions have actually been advocates, I must say. They've been advocates of, of telework and providing flexibility for workers. So it's not the, it's not the situation that uh, the gentleman from California feared. Uh, it's the opposite uh, uh, situation where the, the union representatives in this case are saying telework is actually something that helps the quality of life of the employees that they represent and they have not been obstructionists. They've actually been advocates of finding ways to make workers more productive by utilizing where, where it is appropriate. And there are some cases, as the director out, where it's impossible, but they've, they have been uh, certainly open and supportive of, of the practice. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for five minutes. I thank the chairman, and I, let me begin by uh, reinforcing the chairman's point. In my experience in local government, uh, and here in the National Capital Region as the chairman of the Council of Governments was actually we, the workforce was more than cooperative. They saw, uh, they saw telework as actually a benefit. Telework is not defined as five days a week out of the office, by the way. Telework officially is defined as at least one day of the week, not at your normal place of work, uh, in a remote location. It could be from home or wherever. I think in an era where we're worried about recruitment and retention, not only in the uh, private sector, but in the public sector. Uh, telework is a tool. Uh, I also believe in the post-9-11 world, telework is an essential part of your continuity of operations plan. Uh, we, if you don't have a vigorous uh, telework uh, plan in place, I don't know how you get to a continuity of operations plan. Um, but I would say to you, Mr. Barry, I, I think, based on my own experience, um, I was the chairman of Fairfax County right across the river. Yes, sir. I had a workforce of 12,000. I set a goal. The goal was 20% of our eligible workforce teleworking by the year 2005. We exceeded that goal. The first thing we did was to decide, well, who's eligible? So we didn't have a zoo, but for example, police officers can't call in their beat. So they had to work. They couldn't, they couldn't not show up. Uh, but we identified the rest of the workforce, and then we said, okay, 20% of that workforce, what are we gonna do? But it requires a leadership from the top. Managers supervisors are not going to do it if they honestly at the end of the day believe this is lip service. In a region as congested as ours, uh, not to do a, not to have the federal government leading telework is almost criminal. And yet consistently it's been the federal government that's been the laggard in our region, behind the private sector, behind state and local government. So we need to systematize telework. It's got to be in HR policy manuals. The workforce needs to know very clearly what's expected of me if I sign up for this. How will I be supervised? Supervisors need to know how to evaluate workers. Uh, this is not rocket science. It's not terra incognita. We've got lots of experience. But I, I urge you strongly to systematize telework. And Mr. Chairman, I, I would urge Mr. Berry to come back to us maybe in six months and uh, talk to us on this subject alone maybe. Uh, because I do think it's such an important tool. And I'm delighted to hear of your support, Mr. Berry. Uh, let me ask, uh, one of the things we've talked about in this committee, uh, uh, and I hear increasingly uh, a, a source of concern, not only in the workforce but among federal contractors, is uh, sort of the loss of expert acquisition and, and procurement uh, capability within the federal government. H how are we going to address that very complex subject? You know, OPM has, has uh, the team that was there before me did a, a pretty good job in, on helping with the stimulus bill, recognizing that that was going to be a critical hire group. And uh, OPM created a, a special category and uh, conferred, uh, you know, deferential to uh, the agency so that they could move forward 
um, with direct hire authority in that, that regard. And, and I think uh, so far that looks like it's been very helpful to, to many of the agencies in, in moving quickly with the stimulus and recovery uh, funds. Um, I'm actually looking at and thinking that another category that is in dire need and of equal importance is our HR professional capacity throughout the government. Um, <clears throat> in many cases, uh, that has essentially been hollowed out over time. And uh, as agencies seek under, these, under this bill, and, 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 and in, uh, especially agencies that are in a growing uh, situation, like the IRS, like the Defense Department, that will be hiring a significant number of employees, it's essential that they have super uh, HR staff on board. And so one of the things we're looking at is how OPM can play a, a significant role in making that easier as well, speeding up that process, putting it into plain English, and, uh, and creating essentially a pool of applicants that would be pre-certified, if you will, through the, uh, you know, a regular application, wide open, competitive process, but that th then the agencies would be able to, to hire directly from that pool of expertise. And, and get the HR staff that they need on. So uh, I think there's probably other categories we're going to have to treat similarly, uh, but uh, hopefully those can be some first, you know, we've made some solid steps with the contracting position that you discussed. I think we can, we can continue that progress and move it forward. I think the feedback we get is, especially when you move to large, complex, integrated uh, uh, contracts, uh, you know, making sure we've got the resident expertise in-house is increasingly a challenge uh, because, frankly, that expertise gravitating toward the private sector is very tempting. Yeah. Uh, the other problem, let me ask you, though, is uh, it actually has to do with policy, not just talent and resources. Uh, many contractors will talk about the fact that they'll have many, many, many project managers, contract managers over the life of the contract. Um, that leads to a discontinuity in management, different <laughs> expectations about scope of work, and often some distortions as a result in terms of the, the work product deliver, delivered. Are there things we could do to try to incentivize more continuity in the contract management uh, part of the federal government? You know, that's, that's a great question, Mr. Connolly, and, and, and I don't have anything off the top of my head to, to give you some specifics in that regard, but it's certainly something I can look into. I think it's, it's something we need to pay attention to. We also need to be careful, as we talked about with Delegate Norton, as, as we move into an era where we might be dealing with much more insourcing rather than outsourcing, um, that that continuity can also be provided in-house as well, so that uh, as we move things from the private sector, that we can also provide a smooth management transition as well. So we're going to have to wrestle with, with those issues in both directions. My final question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, both Delegate uh, Norton and I represent lots of federal workers, um, and both of us were here in Washington before the Metro was constructed. Uh, now 40 percent, I believe, of the total passengers every day on a very successful system are, in fact, federal workers. What would happen if we shut down Metro tomorrow and the federal workforce no longer had Metro to be able to get to work? It would be a disaster. Um, it would be, you know, the road system is not set up to handle uh, that amount of people. Um, the Metro system is critical to the smooth and federal operation of this government. and. Uh, and its headquarters operations. And uh, uh, I can't imagine uh, uh, our effective operation without it. Uh, it's, it's critical. So one might inferentially conclude from your testimony that the federal government has more than a passing interest in the success of Metro and in its financing. <laughs> uh, well, I think you might want to take that, uh, that question up with the director of the Office of Management and Budget. But uh, I certainly personally, as a rider and user, as a, as a local boy who has grown up in this area, and uh, uh, Carmen Turner, who is my beloved mentor, uh, God rest her soul, um, uh, you know, who was, uh, ran the metro system at one point. Um, I, I love the metro system. I think it's great. It's great for our air quality in this area. And it's, it's a great asset to living in the Washington, D.C. area. And it's critical for our federal employees. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. The leading question, but uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> It's certainly a nice segue. We do have a, an upcoming hearing on the Metro uh, in, the, in this subcommittee that uh, Ms. Norton has been a, a major advocate for, so we will certainly address that issue. Um, I, I do recognize, uh, no, okay, uh, the, the, the leading, the ranking member for the entire committee, Mr. Isaac, has joined us, but he's declined his opportunity uh, to question. Rather than do another round of questioning, which I don't think is necessary, uh, is there, are, are there points 
that you'd like to amplify for the committee in terms of uh, just generally uh, where you, th you know, you've been in the seat for seven days, and so I don't expect you to have the whole thing figured out yet. Uh, that it'll take at least a month. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you do have some points that we haven't in our thorough questioning uh, you know, raised, uh, please, we're happy to give you some ample time to, to talk about those and the way forward. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that opportunity. I'll just make two quick points for the committee. Um, and uh, the first would be, I think it's, it's important that the Office of Personnel Management seek to get some points on the board here. And uh, we're going to be trying to do that in three key areas in this first year uh, on the job. First is in hiring reform. We're going to try to do that better. Now, I know that has, a, that has been a rock that has sunk many a ship, but uh, we're going to try. Uh, we're going to be working on reforming security clearances and making sure that that is secure and easy. Um, so that, uh, and I know those two things might not go hand in glove, so we're going to have to be very careful with it, but we've got to, where there's dupl duplication, we need to weed it out and make it work better. And then third, I'm going to try to put points on the board on work life and workplace for the federal employees. I think it's essential. We've talked about a few of those items today. There are many more we can do, and I'm going to be about that. In terms of the bigger picture, uh, we, we, we discussed a little bit about the overall of maybe building a majority pay system. The, the third and final thing I'd make uh, to the committees to draw to their attention, it's going to be my intention. Uh, the mission of OPM right now is defined as providing an effective workforce for the federal government. Now, I, I think that's a relatively low bar mission. Um, uh, we need to obviously succeed at that mission. I think we need a bigger vision. My vision is not that we just provide an effective workforce, but that the United States government, since it is the largest employer, has a special responsibility of being the model employer to the nation. And my hope is, is to work with everyone in this room and with HR professionals throughout the government, throughout the private sector, uh, throughout this Congress, to decide what are the best practices that are out there today and hold ourselves accountable, put metrics on the board. We may not get it done in the first term of the Obama administration. We may not get it done in the second term of the Obama administration, uh, if the American people give that to us. But uh, it is, it's a path we can work towards to be the model employer and, uh, and to implement those best practices for the men and women of the civil service. And that's going to be my vision, sir. I look forward to working with this committee to accomplish it, and I thank you very much for your opportunity to be with you today. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, sir. I apologize, but uh, could I ask just one question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Please. Uh, I, I applaud you for your goals. One goal that this committee, I, I believe, is concerned about is uh, the use of annuitants and the, the, the whole process in the retirement. Will you be trying to or work with us on a reform that will allow for an efficient retention of our most skilled workers? I, I think, Mr. Ice, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. That is, that's an issue we've got to wrestle with. It's a good one. Um, I, I will be supportive of the principle. Um, there's some cautions that we just have to be careful with. Um, I think we need to recognize, uh, you know, on one hand, with an aging society, we, we've got to figure out how to recapture that talent and reuse it uh, effectively. But at the same time, we, we, we don't want to foreclose promotional opportunities for mid-level managers who, who might see that, okay, we might, in solving one problem, create another, and that someone feels, well, there's no future for me here, I'll leave the federal government. So, uh, you know, we, we need to be careful as we move forward. And then the, the other thing we need to be sensitive to is we have to figure, as the President has said, how to make federal service cool again. Um, how do we bring in that next generation? Uh, you know, how do we, we inspire that next generation to come into public service? And I think there's creative ways we can do that and accomplish all of those objectives together. But if we keep all of them in mind, I hope we can, we can craft a solution that'll work. Well, thank you. I, uh, I hope when you do an analysis of the number of former federal workers who are in fact uh, in second careers as lobbyists or contractors back to and in the same seats yeah. they used to be in, that you weigh that as a, uh, a portion of the reform most needed. I, I think that's a great point, Mr. I say. You know, and there could be also, we could, might be able to be creative about this. Just let me throw out an idea that, for future discussion. You know, what if, as we said, if we were reemploying an annuitant and, and not offsetting their annuity? for a term period, let's say a couple of years. What if as a condition of that, that reappointment, 
uh, they would agree to, to spend 30% of their time on training a mid-level manager to move up to fill their position when their term would expire? Or what if they would potentially adopt a newbie? You know, somebody who's just coming in who I hear constantly, one of the reasons we have a, a, a such a low rate of hiring interns into the federal government is because we don't really support them. We kind of throw them into a job. There's not many young people around them. There's no one there to coach them and mentor them. Well, what if as a condition of this, maybe you had to sign on and be a coach to a young person coming in and teach them the ropes and teach them how the federal government works? That may be a very effective knowledge transfer. And if, if we can creatively design that, then I believe the investment that will be required to accomplish it with the, the reemployment of the annuitants may well be a very good one for the taxpayer. And so I look forward to working with you on, on balancing those, uh, those multiple issues. I do too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we did have one clarification uh, uh, on the part of Ms. Holmes Norton, and, and I would obviously offer the same uh, uh, opportunity for the gentleman uh, from Utah as well. But Ms. Holmes Norton. I, I just wanted to clarify what you said about diversity. Did you say that diversity hasn't moved since 1985? It has, it has been very slight improvements. How do you account uh, for that? Uh, it, it, you know, it is, it is, we need to do better. We need to figure out how to involve the richness of our society and reflect it in our workforce that is fully legal and fully appropriate because we need that breadth of skills in our, our civil service. Mr. Barry, would you uh, again get to the chairman of the committee the figures on race and sex by grade in the federal workforce today? and in, the, in, in 1985, and would you please break that down? We, diversity doesn't mean all minorities get packed together. Right. They're black people, they're Hispanics, they're Asians. Break it down the way the, the um, figures uh, uh, do uh, uh, if they are done appropriately. I'd be very happy to, Ms. Norton, and I think you'll also be very happy to hear. I don't know if, if the committee, uh, uh, the president announced this week that the deputy director that will be serving with me at the Office of Personnel Management, and I'm very excited by this, is uh, Christine Griffin, who is now the EEOC Commissioner for Disability. And I think she's going to bring a, a, a special focus and attention and skill set on this issue to us in the department. Um, I think she's going to be phenomenal if the Senate confirms her, and I really look forward to working with her. But we'll get you that information for the record. Would the gentlelady yield on that item? I'd be happy to yield to uh, the gentleman. Could you, I would suggest that you also take a look at your intern program and, the, um, and look at the profile there. By addressing the intern program, you may be able to, to solve that, but you first got to look at what, is the, you know, what are the facts as they apply to the intern program. Does that reflect the diversity in the community? And if it does, then you know where you can address and, and move this, this gen. If it doesn't, then you got to look other ways. But I look specifically at your intern program, see if that reflects the numbers that you want and the profile you want, and if it's so, then you know where to focus. If I, I could, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bilberry, I think you're, you're right. You, we also need to look not just at the interns, but at mid-career training programs and other sources like that, because they're essentially the pipeline, if you will, as you go up the ladder. And, and I think we need to look at this not just for the GS scale. We need to look at it at SES. We need to look everywhere. We need to have diversity throughout the government and at all of our ranks and make sure we're providing opportunity to all of our citizens and encouraging that. And so. We need, within the law, absolutely. And, and we need to look at each of those paths, internships, training programs, uh, SES development, candidate development pools, uh, and, and pay attention to all of them. Well, uh, Director Berry, we want to congratulate you on your, on your new appointment. Uh, and we appreciate your willingness to come before the committee and help us with our work. And we look forward to working with you because the, the tasks of this committee and, and your own responsibilities uh, do overlap at so many different points. But thank you for your, your time. It's been an honor and a pleasure, sir. Thank you all. Should I take this? <laughs> I'd like to welcome the second panel, uh, if we may.
Uh, welcome. It is the uh, custom of this committee that all witnesses are, are to be sworn in. Uh, could I ask you to please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Let the record show that the witnesses both answered in the affirmative. Yvonne D. Jones is Director of Strategic Issues Team, Government Accountability Office. Yvonne Jones is the Director of the Strategic Initiatives Team at GAO, where she analyzes the federal government human capital issues and 2009 fiscal stimulus oversight issues. At GAO, Ms. Jones also worked as the Director of the Financial Markets and Community Investment Team. Prior to joining GAO in 2003, Ms. Jones worked at the World Bank, where she developed projects in the education sector in East Asian countries, assisted sub-Saharan African countries in reducing their commercial bank debt levels, and helped countries design financial and private sector restructuring programs in Eastern and Central Europe and in the former Soviet Union. Uh, Dr. Donald Kettle, Professor of Political Science and Robert A. Fox, Professor of Leadership, University of Pennsylvania, is the incoming Dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Dr. Kettle is also a non-resident senior fellow at Washington's Brookings Institution, the executive director of the Century Foundation's Project on Federalism and Homeland Security, and academic coordinator of the Government Performance Project. Dr. Kettle has consulted for the government organizations <coughs> at all levels in the United States and abroad, and he is regularly a columnist for Governing Magazine, which is read by state and local government officials around the country. I'd also like to congratulate Dr. Kettle on his recent appointment as Dean uh, to the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Dr. Kettle's research focus is primarily on public policy and public management, and he has authored and co-authored or edited over 25 books and numerous scholarly articles on public management and governance, including his new book, which I am about halfway through, uh, which is titled uh, In the Next Government of the United States, Why Our Institutions Fail Us and How to Fix Them. I haven't got to the how to fix them part yet. Uh, Dr. Kettle holds four political science degrees from Yale and has been called the leading government management scholar of his generation, and I agree with that assessment. I most appreciate uh, you joining with us today to share this, your vast experience in, in this field. Uh, let me begin uh, with, with uh, well, why don't, why don't I allow the witnesses first to, to have their opening statements and then we'll proceed to questioning. Uh, Ms. Yvonne Jones, okay. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the state of the federal workforce. The importance of a highly qualified federal workforce cannot be overstated. In 2001, we identified human capital management as a government-wide high-risk area. Progress has been made since then, but the area remains on our high-risk list because of a compelling need for a government-wide framework to advance human capital reform. The framework is vital to, av to avoid further fragmentation within civil service, ensure management flexibility is appropriate, allow a reasonable degree of consistency, provide adequate safeguards, and maintain a level playing field among agencies competing for talent. My remarks today will focus on executive branch agencies and the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, progress in addressing strategic human capital management challenges in four key areas. Leadership, strategic human capital planning, acquiring, developing, and retaining talent, and results-oriented organizational cultures. Top leadership in federal agencies must provide committed attention to address human capital issues. Leadership must embrace reform and integrate the human capital functions into their agency's core responsibilities. OPM plays a key role in leading improvements in all areas of strategic human capital management in the executive branch. We have reported that OPM has made commendable efforts in transforming itself from less of a rulemaker, enforcer, and independent agent to more of a consultant, toolmaker, and strategic partner to executive agencies. Congress also recognized that increased attention to strategic human capital met pardon me, management was needed. In 2002, Congress created the Chief Human Capital Officer position, or CHCO, 
and 24 agencies. The CHCO Council advises and coordinates the activities of member agencies, OPM, and the Office of Management and Budget. The CHCO Council addresses key current and emerging human capital issues. To carry out effective strategic human capital planning, agencies need to ensure that they have the talent and skills mix to address current and emerging challenges, especially as the federal government faces increased staff and executive retirements. An example of the federal government's human capital planning challenges is its acquisition workforce. In prior work, we testified that the acquisition workforce's workload and responsibilities are increasing without adequate attention to its size, its skills, and succession planning. A strategic approach had not been taken across government or within agencies to create a positive image essential to successfully recruit and retain new acquisition professionals. The challenges agencies are facing with sustaining a capable and accountable acquisition workforce contributed to GAO's designation of interagency contracting as a high-risk area in 2005. In our recent 2009 update, it remains a high-risk area at three agencies, the Departments of Defense, Energy, and at NASA. Faced with a workforce with talent and skill gaps, it is important that agencies strengthen their efforts and use available flexibilities from Congress and OPM to acquire, develop, motivate, and retain talent. In recent years, Congress and OPM took a series of important actions to improve federal hiring and recruitment. The Congress provided agencies with increased authority to pay recruitment bonuses and to credit relevant private sector experience when determining annual leave amounts provided agencies with hiring flexibilities, and also OPM has authorized government-wide direct hiring authority for veterinarian medical officers, launched an 80-day hiring model to speed up the hiring process, and reminded agencies that they can also hire older, experienced workers to fill workforce needs. Concerning worker retention, the federal government is well positioned to retain workers. It has a variety of tangible benefits and flexibilities. We have previously stated that the executive branch agencies need to re-examine their use of flexibilities, such as monetary recruitment and retention and special hiring authorities, um, including student employment and work-life programs, such as alternate work schedules, child care assistance, telework opportunities, and transit subsidies. Leading organizations find that to transform themselves, they must fundamentally change their cultures so they are more results-oriented, customer-focused, and collaborative credible performance management systems that align individual team and unit performance with organizational results can help manage this process. Leading organizations also develop and maintain inclusive and diverse workforces at all levels of the organization. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, this completes my statement, and I would be pleased to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Director Jones, and I know you're right to the five minutes, very good. Uh, Dr. Kettle for five minutes, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity to testify before you today on what clearly is one of the most important issues that we as a country face as we try to fashion a workforce that will be up to the challenges of managing our government in the 21st century. To try to deal with those questions, I want to suggest seven basic things that I think we need to focus on. The first is that the point, which has already been echoed a bit this morning, we tend to talk about the federal personnel system as if it were a system, but in fact, it's increasingly no such thing. Uh, it is no exaggeration to say that any agency or any department that has had an opportunity to either get flexibilities or to break completely out of the system has done so, which is an unfortunate commentary on the nature of the current set of rules and procedures that we rely on for hiring the people that we most need to run our government. It's important to remember why it is that we created the civil service system to begin with. Back a century and a half ago, it was an effort to try to not only establish but also, perhaps most important, to make sure that the basic values that we need to try to guide the work of government were put in place. And unfortunately, what's happening with the effort to try to break out of the system is that that effort to define those core values is being lost. So one of the most important things we need to do is to figure out and to spend time talking about, which is why this hearing is so important, what it is that we want our federal workforce to do and what values we want to use to drive it. The second thing is to emphasize the point that public problems require human capital solutions. The Government Accountability Office has done terrific work on the issues of 
the importance of the federal workforce and the importance of expertise in managing federal programs. Uh, GAO has identified th about 30 high-risk areas and has identified human capital problems as being central to 18 of them. Uh, I would disagree only in one modest respect. I think that, in fact, probably all 30 out of 30, one way or another, deal with human capital issues. And we're not going to be able to solve the driving problems that government has at its core without solving the people problems that are needed to be able to get to those solutions. The third thing is that, as I think everyone recognizes, we need to reform entry into the system for new employees. I deal all the time with students who come in excited about the idea of trying to come and work for the federal government and too often end up walking away because the barriers simply seem too great and too large. They go off in internships and don't find the experience exciting. They say they want to work for the federal government and have a hard time identifying which jobs they want to work for and how simply to negotiate the process. Uh, too often what happens is that our best and brightest simply go elsewhere because getting into the government is too hard. So we need, as the, the, the new director of the Office of Personnel Management has recognized, to make it easier for the best and the brightest to get in. Uh, the fourth piece is to recognize that entering from the bottom up is not the only thing that we need to do to try to improve the federal workforce. We have, for example, President Man Presidential Management Fellows Program, which has been uh, successful in recruiting people in the federal workforce, but too often what we succeed in doing is investing the federal government's time and energy and money to train people who then go off to the private sector. So the federal government actually becomes the trainer of first resort for highly skilled employees who then end up leaving federal service. Uh, what we need, I think, is to consider perhaps a, a, an alternative super fellows program where the private sector could engage in the training and the federal government could hire people in laterally at areas, for example, the GS 11 to 13 level, and to allow people to be able to have alternative means of entry into the system. That plus the proposed Roosevelt Scholars Program to create a kind of ROTC-like, ROTC-like process of enabling people to enter federal service but I think provide a series of alternatives for getting the highly skilled workers into the government that we most need. The fifth, as, as I argue in the book that you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, we really need a new set of skills to manage new programs and new tools that we're in the process of inventing. The federal government now finds itself owner of a substantial number of private sector companies and have substantial leverage and ownership stakes in others, and we need to develop the tools that are required that requires not only intellectual capital and figuring out what that means, but development of management skills and making that happen. Uh, sixth, as everyone recognizes, we need much stronger leadership development of people who are inside the government itself. Uh, I'm reminded of what Admiral Thad Allen said as he brought his workers to New Orleans and began to make a difference in the recovery that we needed there. He said, we give, give our field commanders a mission, an area of responsibility and their own resources and assets such as cutters and aircraft, and we leave it up to them. Uh, that came out of a process. He could trust people with doing that because the Coast Guard has perhaps the government's best training program for its employees, and they provide a model. Which gets to my final point, which is that the Office of Personnel Management needs to be playing now a larger role in developing the human capital inside the government, not only the skills and the procedures, but a broader set of thought about what it is that we need for the government to do, what values we need to have in the workforce, and how best to try to administer it. We are facing enormous challenges in the 21st century now, and government has a responsibility to its citizens to deliver. The only way that's going to happen is by focusing first on the importance of building a human capital system that will help solve the problems for the 21st century. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you both very much for your willingness to come before the committee and help us with our work. Let, let, me, uh, let me go right at that point that you've, you've raised, uh, Dr. Kettle. We, ha we have a situation where uh, government has changed very little. Uh, we have a, you know, a founding set of founding documents, the Constitution, that basically describe our roles. Thankfully, uh, the genius of it was that it's, it's, it's vaguely stated and principle-based so that it can adopt to, to uh, changing circumstances. However, legislatively, we're still doing things the way we did uh, you know, 200 years ago. We got rid of the powdered wigs, but essentially, uh, the legislature still works with uh, the, the same uh, structure. Uh, some of that is required uh, because of representative government needs, but I, I do feel that we've, we've really um, 
been slow to adapt. Uh, you can see the changes in, in society, in, in industry, in business. Uh, the technology around us uh, is, is changing at a breakneck speed. And yet, uh, we in government struggle to keep up. And it goes right to this point that we're discussing today. I mean, it, you know, when I, even when I first came here, and I came here seven years ago, uh, I never thought that uh, part of my responsibility would be to find out what, what, how a collateral debt obligation works or how complex derivatives are actually structured. Uh, but now that the American taxpayer is a major purchaser of these, we have to get down to that level of detail. And I can only uh, sympathize with new federal employees who are now are being either to, to asked to either supervise the TARP uh, program or the TALF program or uh, to try to track the money in the stimulus to find out where it's going. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's a tall task to ask anyone to get up to speed on some of these issues uh, where, where at a severe disadvantage. But my, my question is, what is OPM's, the Office of Personnel Management, what is their, what do you see their role in this being? Uh, you know, some of the, the, as I see, some of the best innovation that's occurred has occurred in some of these agencies that are out from under the, the OPM rule structure. Uh, you know, the Defense Department, when we talk about, um, when Director Jones talks about procurement and, uh, and the acquisition workforce, uh, you know, they've got some great stuff going on at DOD. You go on their website and they've got courses there that help educate people who are trying to do Defense Department procurement. Uh, you know, how, how do you see OPM getting a handle on all of this? And is that the right model? I mean, right at the, as a threshold question, is that the model that we want or do we want this individual management, as you described uh, with Pat Allen and the, uh, the Coast Guard, where we, we create, you know, managers in the field and they're making the, the, the adjustments and, and the decisions on, on the ground as they occur in real time. Uh, why don't I give you an opportunity to answer? Well, Mr. Chairman, let me say first that I think this is exactly the right question, that only in trying to attack that are we going to be able to get the government that we need and the taxpayers expect. And in many ways, it has to be a creative tension between, for example, the Fat Allens of the world who are out there trying to devise new strategies for personnel systems that will work, but then trying to find ways of learning in a broad system-wide basis to be able to apply those to the rest of the government. What we can't afford is a, is a series of agencies that-, that Mr. Kettle, could you check your mic just to make sure it's on? It is, uh, it's, it's on now, okay. It okay. Was, the green light was on, but it didn't seem to be working quite right. Uh, this will work better, I think. Uh, we need this creative tension between the two, between the grassroots level efforts to try to strategize on, on how to learn, but an effort to try to make it work system wide. What we cannot afford is a series of pockets of high levels of performance with the rest of the government lagging behind. What OPM has to do is to do three things. The first is it needs to spend its time reminding the rest of us about why it is that it was created and what basic values that we want to have in a workforce. What is it that we want federal workers to look like, to act like, to do, and how we want them to perform? The second is that it needs to spend its time on a government-wide basis thinking about the basic capacities that 21st century government requires. And there are governments around the world, I, th I think, for example, the governments of Denmark and New Zealand that have spent a lot of time at a system level, high level, thinking about basic questions of government capacity. What are the skills that government workers need? And the third thing is then trying on a system-wide basis of devising the strategies to make sure that the workers who do the work have those skills that we need. And this is going to require, I think, some, some retinkering, some, some fundamental rethinking of what it is that OPM does. I think it has to worry about hiring, firing, salaries, annuities. But it's got to be working at the strategic level as well, because if it doesn't, my fear is it's not going to get done. If it doesn't get done, programs are not going to be managed as they need to. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you both for being here and the, the, the work that you do in uh, diving deep into these issues. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Jones, I, it, did you have, I don't know if you're in a position to talk about the Retire Easy program and, and what's happening or not happening there. It's certainly been highlighted in the, 
in the news uh, lately. Can you give us, from your viewpoint, if you have some knowledge about this program as to where it's at and how dire the situation is? There was a quote that said, the agency's retirement modernization initiative remains at risk of failure, uh, end quote. How, how dire is it? Okay. Um, actually, if I would prefer to um, perhaps take um, if, uh, Director Jones, would you just check questions? your mic to make sure it's on? I'm sorry. Or pull it's, it just it's a little on, closer. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, actually, it was another team at GAO that actually that that did that work. I'm familiar with the generalities of what they what they said, but I am um, not terribly familiar with all of the all of the details of it. But uh, I could provide you with with further information if you wish. Okay, I, I appreciate it. I, was, I didn't know if you had personally been involved in that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there, there was a quote here that said, uh, institutionalizing effective management is critical not only for the success of this initiative, but also for that of other modernization efforts within the agency, end quote. Mm -hmm. it, it alludes to other aspects that are maybe falling down or falling apart or just not coming to fruition despite mm -hmm. uh, heavy investment by uh, uh, our government. From your vantage point, what are those other areas where maybe uh, we should highlight for this committee and, and uh, the, you know, what, what, what is not coming about? What would that allude to when it says other modernization efforts within the agency? Well, I think we, we had done some, some work in, in the past in which um, we had examined uh, OPM's relationships, its um, ability to um, communicate, for example, with other agencies and to um, pr and for them to provide technical assistance to other agencies when they are trying to improve their strategic human capital management planning and and other functions. We had also, in other re reports. Um, indicated that we felt that OPM could improve some of its um, internal functioning, for example, making sure that it had staff that could provide, that have the skills to provide um, service and advice to, um, to the other agencies that it is tasked with, with helping in terms of um, all of the, improving all of the, the functioning of all of the human capital management functions. Um, in the government. Now, we have also done work which suggested that there have been improvements at, at OPM in, in some of these areas. What we- well, what's, your, what's your biggest concern at OPM? If you had to, this is my number one concern, what would mm -hmm. it be? Um, I'd say that um, our number one concern would be um, just to, for OPM to help agencies build the infrastructures uh, as appropriate and depending upon their, their core missions and goals to successfully implement, design, implement, and sustain and human And do they have reforms. the internal staff to actually execute on what you just articulated? Um, I think I, I would need to provide, to um, get you more specific information on that, whether in fact they have the specific categories of staff that they need. Uh, let me ask you, this is an interesting uh, quote from this report that you provided uh, here on uh, page two. It says, uh, quote, government-wide about one-third of federal employees on board at the end of fiscal year 2007 will become eligible to retire in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, from your perspective and your experience, what what is this going to lead to? It, it, it expand that thought and that concern, and, and I, we have just a few seconds okay. here. Well, we, we have concerns because knowing that um, so many um, staff and also um, members of the senior executive service um, will be eligible to retire. It doesn't mean that they will retire, but they will be eligible to retire. We, we feel that it's very important that OPM and the executive branch agencies undertake if they haven't, and continue to undertake the efforts that are necessary for them first to identify um, their skills and, and then to undertake the range of um, activities that they need to to bring in staff at various levels, at the entry level, at the mid-career level as appropriate, and also to try to um, retain older staff that are experienced or also, too, they can also hire in older, experienced staff who haven't previously worked in the federal government. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, You're Mr. Welcome. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes-Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Ms. Jones, I appreciate the um, directness of your assessment on page nine, nine of uh, the GAO report. In short, the federal hiring process is often an impediment to the very customers it is designed to serve in that it makes it difficult for agencies and managers to obtain the right people with right skills, and applicants can be dissuaded from public service because of the complex and lengthy procedures. And of course, uh, Mr. Berry testified that then you outline actually a series of rather hopeful things that have already begun, including such common sense things as common uh, as uh, announcement templates that are common for um, occupations such as, as secretary accounting and, and the like. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in this 80-day hiring model. Now, understand that's already almost three months. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't. I didn't uh, that's on page 10. Uh -huh. Launched an 80-day hiring oh. model to help yes. speed up the hiring process. Da, 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 da. Why does it take three months? Is that used across the government? What are the what are the what are what is the agency doing during that time? that takes three months but they, now that so many people are out of work and probably are looking for government employment? Well, the, as we understand it, the 80 days includes the time from uh, the period when um, OPM makes a public announcement of... Excuse me, uh, Ms. Jones, could you pull that microphone closer? I cannot hear you. The, eight, the 80 days Thank is you. the period of time from when the, the announcement is made public to actually bringing the person uh, the individual on board into into the agency, and these are people who don't need security clearances. It's just ordinary hires, right? As I understand it, it's regular regular hires. So, yes. what takes so long? Well, is it the agency? Is the OPM? What is the what? Well, that's a lot of time. We've been no. waiting for a job, and if you got a number of applications out, mm -hmm. <laughs> it just well, may be as, too. As too I, I understand from from uh, OPM's published uh, work on this. What they are trying to do is is estimate accurately the amount of time that it would take uh, to to send the announcement out to to receive the applications for the whole review process, and then also I'm not sh sure that uh, not all applicants are um, ready sort of instantly to move to move into yeah. Their but positions. an 80-day hiring model must be some kind of, of template itself. Is mm -hmm. this used now across the government? in all the agencies or not? I'm not sure if it's used in all of the agencies well, or not. Well, I understand why they, yeah, I, you, you say an 80-day hiring model, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if the hiring model was used in one agency, like the veterinarians that they had such a, a need for, whether mm -hmm. that's government-wide, and I wish you would, uh, to the extent that you're depending on that in your report, get information mm -hmm. to us about what kind of, what agencies we're talking about. Yes, uh, we'd be for glad example, to For example, the, the, uh, Mr. Barry in his testimony talked about funds, I guess, that they've received for the American Recovery and Investment Act, and that, they're, that they're, they've developed a tool to make it easier for federal agencies, I didn't get an opportunity to ask him about this, federal agencies mm -hmm. to document new hires that are funded by the Recovery and Investment Act. Well, you know, they got a timeline on that one uh, that's like nothing you've ever seen because we're trying to get people back to work. I wonder if, if um, I hope this is not a, a, a three-month uh, 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 um, wonder, um, but I, I I wonder if using whether in in your own uh, from from your own background and expertise using the hurry up procedures we have told them to use uh, in the uh, stimulus bill that you that perhaps some of that could be transferable. We could learn from that so that we might speed up the hiring process more generally uh, after the Investment Act uh, has done its work. The, that, well, I, I'm aware that um, <clears throat> with respect to hiring for, for the Stimulus Act that um, OPM held a, a kind of interagency conference back in, in March of this year, and they had uh, discussions with um, numerous agencies who are required to implement programs under the Stimulus Act. There was a lot of discussion, for example, about direct hire um, authorities, particularly, I think Mr. Berry mentioned, uh, for the acquisition workforce. Whether some of the direct hire authorities um, 
exist, for example, as you said, for the, the veterinarian, veterinarian medical officers. OPM recently made that direct hire authority available because it became aware of the fact that there we have an across the government shortage of those hiring officers. Well, I, well, well, what we need to know is, you know, if you get desperate enough, yeah, you'll hire some veterinarians. I don't have a sense from the GAO report mm -hmm. whether we have a template across agency lines that is even an 80-day model. Uh, it seems to me to be an awfully long time, uh, even in w with job shortages. So I believe that your report, a very an, an excellent report, shows that there's still a lot we have to learn, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, is it Dr. Kettle? Yes, indeed. Doctor, first of all, welcome to the University of Maryland. I'm a graduate of a law school, and my oldest daughter just graduated from the School of Public Policy. And she had a great experience, and so we welcome you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Cummings. I'm very much looking forward to joining everyone in Maryland. Very well. Let me ask you something. I am the um, I'm the uh, subcommittee chairman of the Coast Guard, and I just found it interesting that you mentioned them here. Um, and I was when I looking at what you said about leadership. And when I read what you wrote and I hear what you said, I'm just curious as to do you think in Katrina there was a, um, you, you think some of the other agencies failed because they were not properly taught to lead? I, for better or worse, Mr. Cummings, unfortunately, Mr. I Dr. think- Dr. Kettle, is your, your mic on? It, it is on, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Me, Could you move that a little closer to you then? It's, I'm, let's see, I'm on as short a leash as I can get here, I think. Okay. I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but let me tell you what I've said in the past about Katrina um, as a fix your mic. What I said was Katrina was one of the greatest, it should have been one of the greatest embarrassments to our country. Uh, that we could have people uh, drowning in their own urine and unable to get a piece of bread or drink of water in five days. And I, and, and I, for the life of me, I'm trying to figure out how does that happen that we, and I think part of leadership should be that when you, uh, prepare for situations like a Katrina, especially post 9-11, um, that there should be integrity, there should be empathy, there should be clarity, people should have a game plan. And I think that's all a part of leadership, I think. And you should be in a position so that when the rubber meets the road, you don't discover that suddenly there's no road. And so these were government agencies. And I know that you didn't say they failed. I'm saying they failed. And I'm just wondering what made, except the Coast Guard. They saved over 35,000 people um, and did it well. And Thad Allen is, is a great leader. But I'm just trying to figure out what is it that the Coast Guard, what does that mean, teaching them leadership and then there are a lot of people professor who and this is no this is not a trick question by the way um there are a lot of people who i think they don't know that they're leaders and does that does this entail bringing that out of them are, are you following what i'm saying some people no, just absolutely come, some people come in they think they're supposed to just come in and you know be on the assembly line and go home at the end of the day, but, but in, in fact, there is leadership there, and is that a part of, of, of the training that is bringing that out of them so that when they get into the Katrina type situation, somebody can stand up and say, wait a minute, let's get this done? And Mr. Cummings, I just couldn't agree with you more on everything that you've said, and it's unfortunate the fact that some agencies did go to New Orleans and did fail and the Coast Guard arrived and started to succeed. And the crucial difference between the two is that the Coast Guard 
in fact, led. It trained people. It had a human capital system within it to develop leaders, and it trained each of its workers from the very highest levels to the frontline people to understand that their role was, in fact, to lead, and so that they consciously understood it was their job to solve problems. And unfortunately, it was the case that for many other people and other agencies, they didn't perceive that, didn't have the training, and had not done what the Coast Guard had done, which was first to figure out how to learn from previous cases on how best to try to adapt to things they had never seen before, and secondly, how to try to train their workers, their employees, their leaders to be able to respond effectively to those crises when they arose. They developed a system within the Coast Guard to do that, which is why they succeeded where their agencies did not, which is why, as I said, I've had my polite disagreement with my friends from the GAO who say that maybe only 18 of the 30 issues are human capital issues. I would argue that all 30, all the crucial issues that the government faces at the core have to do with human capital, have to do with leadership development, the development of specific skills that are required to, so that competencies are in place, and so that individual workers throughout the government understand that it is their job to lead at whatever level they sit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time is up. Thank you. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me ask you about uh, what we've been hearing about um, interns and internships. Um, it sounds like the federal government doesn't have a structured approach. Maybe it's each agency figuring it out for itself. Uh, and we actually heard Mr. Burry sort of indicate that a lot of interns end up dis discouraged uh, at the idea of a, making a career out of federal service and just find it too hard and the experience, frankly, unsatisfying. Now, that really troubles me because this is not rocket science. The private sector has figured out how to have very creative and structured internship programs they use for recruitment and retention. Uh, many local and state governments have done the same. My local government certainly had a very structured internship program that has been very successful in terms of dealing with young people uh, and getting them to think about a career in local government. Why do you think the federal government hasn't figured this out, and why are we turning what should be a positive experience into actually something that's a net negative? Mr. Connolly, I think the basic problem is it goes back to the basic OPM issues that we were talking about before, about thinking about the system-wide human capital issues that we need to try to be able to address. There are some superb internship programs in the federal government, and the very best, I think, is actually at the Government Accountability Office. When my students ask where to go, I send them there first because GAO does everything that we understand ought to be done. There's mentoring, there's a job development, there's rotation, and people, students of mine who have come away with that say, I'd like to spend my career working for that. Unfortunately, we either have a, a process that makes it difficult to get in, when students get in, they don't have very good experience. When they do have the good experience and they want to be able to pursue it, the entry process in the federal service later becomes difficult to negotiate. Later, when they try to enter through the Presidential Management Fellows Program, they find it impossible to negotiate. And then students who sometimes get into the, personnel, uh, the Presidential Management Fellows Program end up spending two or three years, look on it as something to punch their ticket, go make more money in the private sector, and we lose the investment that we've made. Uh, all of those things, if we were to try to design system, a system more designed to fail us, it would be hard to do better. Uh, this is an opportunity to sit and think carefully about how we can get our very best students into the federal workforce, how to train them, how to develop them, how to make them leaders, but also to think about other alternatives. Uh, this kind of lateral entry at higher levels where students get experience in the private sector and come back in a little bit later. If there's anything that we know about today's students is that the idea of a lifetime career for 30 years working for one employer is a non-starter. So why we should spend all of our energy only on entry and retention when some of it is going to be a back and forth kind of career is, a, is an important personnel and strategic workforce issue that we have to try to deal with. Flexibility with an idea toward focusing on developing competencies and leaders is the basic approach we need to take with a procedure that doesn't get in the way. And thank you. And, and by the way, on, on presidential management interns, I thought there was sort of a fast track. If you got into PMI, there was a fast track to get into federal service uh, after your internship was completed. Is that still the case? It's, it's still the case. Unfortunately, first, it's hard to get in. Uh, what a presidential management fellow finalist position essentially does is give you a hunting license and with a, a large stack of, uh, of notices saying, good luck and we hope you can find a job. Yeah. 
And then unfortunately what we've discovered is that there's a very high level of turnover for presidential management fellows who get into the government, who then go in, spend two or three or four years, and in some cases leave. And the numbers are, are embarrassingly high and precise to the people we're going to be trying hardest to recruit and to retain. Um, could I ask about, uh, going back to our discussion, uh, sort of uh, specialized acquisition expertise in the federal government, uh, I'm really concerned at the fact that we have more than double procurement and basically acquisition procurement positions have roughly remained stagnant. Uh, what do you think we need to be doing as we move forward? That, the question's for me? Certainly. Let's start oh. with you, Ms. Oh. Jones. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part for me, please? Yes, the question has to do with the fact that we have increasingly large, complex uh, acquisition uh, contracts in the federal government. Yes. And, and, and I'm worried that we're losing expertise to manage those projects, mm -hmm. uh, both to the private sector to, uh, and, and to retirement. And, and, and we're also simply not keeping up with the volume. Mm -hmm. So what, what can we do about that yes, across the government? Well, I think um, in some of the work that GAO has done, we have suggested that um, agencies need to um, assess, do a needs assessment in, in, in terms of their acquisition workforces to see um, essentially um, how, how many are going to retire and with what particular kinds of skill levels and where, where they're located in, their, in the agencies, and then to undertake um, more intensive um, recruitment efforts, which could in, entail um, um, a number of things. It could entail making contacts with, um, what do you call it, professional organizations of, of acquisition uh, workforce people. It could um, entail trying to interest many more younger people in the acquisition workforce. It could um, entail also trying to keep some of the people who are eligible to retire to keep them on um, after their, their, their eligibility is, is enforced. It could also entail bringing in people who have not worked in the federal government before, perhaps older people who are experienced in acquisition techniques but who would be interested in working in the federal government. Uh, Mr. Connolly, let me suggest a couple of things. The first is the idea of addressing this question as a, as a systemic problem that needs to be handled systemically. Uh, we need to try to develop a strategy for doing this, which requires, secondly, understanding the basic competencies that are going to be required for contract management. There are a lot of people who enter federal service not with an idea of becoming contract managers of their career, but their accountants, their biologists, their chemists, their veterinarians to become contract managers. And the mismatch between the skills that they need and the skills they come in with is often very large. And we need to un identify those competencies that they need. We need to try, thirdly, to develop those competencies in a systematic way with the kind of training that Mr. Berry suggested. We need to try to make the contract workforce a, a high prestige area in with an understanding that these are people who are leveraging, in many cases, hundreds of billions of dollars, so the performance needs to hinge on their ability to be able to take that job and inculcate the values that we need. And finally, uh, I think we need to try to bring our performance system into line so that it creates leverage not only within the government but across into the, the private sector workforce and the private sector contractors who are responsible for the performance of these programs. Performance has to be understood as this kind of multi-sectoral thing. But it goes back to the question of, of taking a systemic problem and handling it systematically, which I think is an essential task that OPM has got to take on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the former chairman of this same com subcommittee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five thank minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank uh, both the witnesses. As I've listened to the questions and, and answers, it continues to occur to me, and perhaps this would have been a better question for Mr. Berry, but it seems to me that we focus a great deal on the Office of Personnel Management and I'm not always convinced that the Office of Personnel Management has as much influence over the actual functioning of agencies within the federal government. It seems to me that, that OPM is 
more of an advisor, a recommender. But when it comes to actually <laughs> implementation, that it just doesn't have it. I, I mean, and I know, Ms. 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 Jones, maybe this is not a good question for you. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily your role. But how do you see OPM in terms of the ability to actually get its recommendations or <laughs> its decisions <laughs> implemented? Um, well, we have done work in the past in which we um, suggested and in fact stated that OPM um, can assist um, the agencies in terms of providing suggestions, providing technical assistance in terms of developing policies and providing frameworks for them to use in um, designing and um, implementing and even evaluating their, their um, human uh, capital planning processes. We also um, feel that they can share agency best practices and they can work through the Chief Human Capital Officer Council and, and share in information. We have also said, though, that um, OPM has made a lot of um, flexibilities and tools available to the, to the agencies. And um, I think that there are some questions about why there is a range of utilization of some of the human capital flexibilities and tools across agencies. Um, I don't believe that we have actually done work to show why OPM has offered advice and, and tools, and there is this range of, of adoption across Maybe the agencies. Maybe we ought to rename it, make it the Office of Personnel Recommendation. <laughs> uh, well, well I'm, I'm, that might be a better, uh, Professor, let me just ask you your reaction. Yeah. Mr. Day, I think you're right about the point that it's very hard from, from headquarters at OPM to, to push buttons and make things happen throughout the rest of the federal government. But let me try to reframe it a different way and, and sort of ask a, ask a different question. Uh, given the complexity of trying to manage federal contracts, the difficulty of trying to make sure the stimulus package works well, making sure that the bank bailout is an effective program, where are the, where the, where's the big thinking in the government about how to do that? how to do that right, how to do that well. And one of the things that I think that OPM can do, and then by doing it, exert much better leverage, is to think about these thoughts and to try, not on its own, because it can't solve the problem on its own, but to make sure the thoughts are being thought and that ideas are being framed and that competencies are being developed and that the training programs to support that then come out of that. What OPM can do most effectively, beyond trying to drive these procedural changes that we've all talked about and agree on, like making it easier to get into the federal workforce, is to think about what it is that OPM and the federal government needs to do. What, what kind of workforce do we need to get the job done? Somebody's got to be thinking about that, and it ought to be OPM. Right now, I think GAO has been doing a terrific job, but I think that there needs to be a force inside the executive branch to drive that at, at the highest strategic levels to make sure that we have the government that we need and that we deserve. And so it seems to me that you, you're leading us towards a more mandated approach. I mean, leadership, you mentioned, I got my own little definition of leadership that I often like to use that says that leadership is the ability to get other people to do what you want them to do, but because they want to do it. And it seems to me that we're not getting the agencies to want to comply with some of these recommendations that I hear coming out of OPM or coming from GAO. And we really go around the circle, around the circle. It's kind of a repeat, a repeat, a repeat. But maybe this is the time when something can really happen because I haven't seen the kind of changes during the 10 years that I've been here and we've had these discussions. It seems to me that, that, that the more we talk about change, the more things remain the same. <laughs> 
But Mr. Davis, for better or worse, we have epic problems on our plate right now on a scale unlike anything that anybody's ever seen. And ultimately, one way or another, these all come down to people problems. And the only way that government's going to be able to solve that is by putting a workforce in place to be able to do it. And it's an incredibly exciting time to be talking to students about and new employees and people interested in lateral entry and joining the federal service because there's an opportunity to leverage an enormous amount of public good given the tools that government has. But it requires some thinking about what it is that we want to go and the direction in which we want to drive this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rather than do another uh, round of questions, uh, I'd like to offer you the same opportunity I, I gave to uh, Director Berry uh, in the previous panel. Are there, uh, are there points that you would like to amplify in terms of uh, the way forward? And uh, th this is, a, this is a, an important time. Uh, as you, you, meant, you both mentioned, uh, if, if, if necessity is the mother of invention, then we certainly have fertile ground uh, with all of the uh, myriad problems that we're facing now in government and, and the necessity of coming up and dealing with the complexities of the financial institutions and the problems we have now. And uh, it's, it's just, uh, you know, and, and globally with the, uh, the, the interface between our agencies and, and, uh, and the rest of the world, uh, we really need our federal employees to step up. And, and they are willing to do so, but I think they are shackled in a system that, that diminishes their ability to reach their maximum potential. Uh, on that very broad point, uh, uh, Director Jones or, or Dr. Kettle, both of you, if, you, if you'd like to just sort of uh, let the committee know what you think is most important about that way forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that's ex exactly the right question. Let me try to take a stab at answering it in, in two ways. It's easy to talk broadly, but it's probably more effective to talk about who needs to do what. And the first who, I think, has to be the Office of Personnel Management, which I think faces a strategically important, critically important time to rethink what it does and how it goes about doing it. And part of its job has to be the process of trying to figure out, on behalf of the federal government, what the answer to those questions is. That there has to be some kind of institutional knowledge and capacity debate, if you will, about trying to think about what are the problems we face and what is it the federal government is going to need to solve them and how can we get it done. Because not that how many days it takes to hire a federal employee isn't important, because it's critically important. It drives people away. But it's got to be in pursuit of the bigger picture. And OPM has got to take that bigger strategic role, because if it doesn't, my fear is it won't happen. And if it doesn't happen, we'll find ourselves crippled in trying to solve these problems we know we have to address. The second thing is uh, to, to applaud this committee and subcommittees work in this area because congressional attention on these issues is something that's terribly important and critical in sustaining the debate and ensuring that there is the possibility for action and creating an opportunity for a broader conversation on these issues. This has the risk of sounding a little bit philosophical, but there has to be a kind of broad discussion and debate about rethinking the public service because we're rethinking government, whether we like it or not, and we need a public service that's going to be supportive of that. And Congress has a terribly important role in supporting that debate and discussion. Okay. Thank you. Director Chair Jones. Mr. Chairman, um, OPM has undertaken a great deal of work on human capital uh, planning and management for the federal government. Um, a number of, and has put in place a number of tools there. The Congress itself has passed legislation to offer greater flexibilities to, to the agencies. It would appear that this is a time when OPM and the agencies could use either existing mechanisms like the um, Chief Human Capital Officers Council or to use other mechanisms to have discussions about of all of the flexibilities and tools and policies that are available for acquiring and training um, a highly capable federal workforce. What's working? What isn't working? Where are there barriers? Identify the barriers. Undertake discussions as to how those barriers could be removed. Uh, if there are new, new policies that we need to have discussions about that, but then to move forward in terms of trying to develop the kind of federal workforce that we would all like us to have. I want to thank you both on behalf of the subcommittee and the committee. I want to thank you both for your willingness to come forward and help us with this, with this problem. 
Uh, thank you very, very much for your appearance here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good day. I'd like to welcome the next panel. Good afternoon. Uh, it is the committee's policy that all witnesses are, are to be sworn. Could you please uh, stand and, and raise your right hand? Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Let the record show that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you very much for your, for your willingness to, to appear before this committee and uh, help us with our work. I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, Max Deer is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Partnership for Public Service, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to revitalizing our federal government. Mr. Steer previously worked in all three branches of the federal government. Prior to joining the partnership, he served as Deputy General Counsel for Litigation at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. William Bransford is the general counsel and acts as a lobbyist for the Senior Executive Association. He also served as general counsel for several professional associations, including the Federal Managers Association, the FAA Managers Association, and National Council of Social Security Management Association. Uh, Mr. Bransford has written numerous publications on federal employment law and is co-author of a guidebook, The Rights and Responsibilities of Your Federal Employment. He, co he co-hosts uh, Fed Talk, a weekly radio show on Federal News Radio. And Mr. Bransford is a partner at Shaw, Bransford, Villiu, and, and Roth, PC, where he has practiced since 1983. His practice is concentrated on the representation of federal executives, managers, and employees. Prior to joining SBVR, Mr. Bransford was a senior attorney at the Internal Revenue Office, uh, Office of Chief Counsel, representing the Agency on Labor and Employment Law Issues. Uh, Patricia Niehaus is, has been the president of the Federal Managers Association, Chapter 167 at Travis Air Force Base for two terms and was reelected to another two-year term in January 2008. Uh, Ms. Niehaus is presently the Labor Relations Officer for Travis Air Force Base and was first assigned to the Travis Air Force Base Civilian Personnel Office in 1986 at the FMA zone level. She has served as vice president of zone seven for two terms. Welcome. And thank you again for your willingness to appear. Uh, why don't I give you each uh, an opportunity uh, to uh, address the committee with your general remarks and then we'll follow that with questions. Mr. Steer, for five minutes, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, first to begin to thank you for your recognition of public uh, service employees with your announcement of Public Service Recognition Week taking place the first week of May. I think that's uh, very important for the public to have a better understanding about their, their workforce, and that has to come from more awareness of it, uh, and this is a way to do that. Um, this is an incredible opportunity. You heard from 
um, a lot of witnesses about the importance of this moment in time. Just to give you one other way of looking at it, by our estimates, the federal government will be hiring close to 600,000 people.